So myself and many clarinet teachers talk about air support all the time, but what the heck actually is it and how does it actually work? My name is Josh Gu, and after years of studying the clarinet with some of the best teachers from around the world, I am excited to be sharing my knowledge with you. So go to quickstartclarinet.com or check the description on this video to see all of the wonderful resources I have to help you reach your clarinet dreams. And of course, subscribe to this channel for weekly clarinet and music tips and tricks. So air is the most important aspect of playing the clarinet and making sure that we have good air support and really get the reed vibrating is, is really what counts. And it's the difference between this kind of unsupported, weak, wimpy sound, where it's like, okay, but a little bit fuzzy, not super full, sometimes kind of thin, versus really good, well-supported sound. And I tried to play them at approximately the same volume because volume is irrelevant to the air support and the quality of sound. You can have a great full clear sound at a super soft dynamic or also at a loud dynamic. Um, so that's a little bit separate and not so important. So I wanna talk about the actual anatomy behind getting that good air support and how to sort of think about it and work on it in your own playing. I should say at first that I am not a biologist, I'm not a scientist, uh, I don't actually know super in depth the anatomy behind this, um, but I have studied it a bit and have a very, very basic understanding of it. Uh, some of the things that I say may not be 100% exactly the science behind it, but it's the way that I think about it and I think whatever helps you to think about it uh, in a certain way to get the sound that you want, that's what counts. So I'm gonna sort of dive into that anatomy stuff a little bit. So the first thing that we have to think about is actually how does the air move? How do we get air into our body and how do we get the air out of our body? So the way that it works is when we breathe, our diaphragm, which is a muscle down here uh, under the ribs, the diaphragm contracts and sort of flattens out. The ribs and the sort of chest muscles expand the ribs, and by dropping the diaphragm and expanding the ribs, it creates an area of low pressure in our lungs. And the way air works is it flows from areas of high pressure to low pressure. So if we have lower pressure in our lungs than in the air around us, then the air is going to come in through our mouth and or nose and fill up the lungs. So when we're breathing, we wanna make sure that we're as relaxed as possible to get the air to come in. We can't actually force the air to come in at all. It's just this very natural f contracting the diaphragm, opening up the ribs, and that lets the air come in. There's no like sucking or forcing any <gasps> anything like that. Um, any sound that you hear when you're breathing in is just something in your throat or your mouth or nose even somewhere something is uh, constricting and actually vibrating. That's what the sound is, is the vibration. So if you get any, <gasps> any of that kind of sound, it's just the throat actually being too tight and not letting the air pass because the, the air is sort of vibrating through it as it goes by. So what you want is really, really relaxed throat, mouth, uh, all, all of the breathing in areas, just think of those as an open tube. Use the ribs and the diaphragm. And again, you're not even gonna think about using these. These muscles are so subconscious. In fact, your diaphragm doesn't actually even have nerves that your brain can process or, or be aware of, consciously be aware of. So you can't really feel what your diaphragm is doing. So when you breathe in, it's just open up, open up, relax, let the air in. So there might be a little bit of sound, but as, as minimal sound as possible, as quiet as possible is the goal. Now that's how the air comes in. Now for the air to go out, we have to do the opposite. We sort of pressurize the air in the lungs by squeezing the diaphragm uh, relaxes and, and goes up. The ribs come in and the air goes out because we have higher pressure in here than out there. So then the air moves out naturally. 
Now, when it comes to air support, pressure is somewhat important and, and something to think about. And the way that we get that air pressure is by actually engaging our abdomen. And the abdomen is actually holding down the uh, diaphragm, which sort of keeps everything open and has like a good volume of air in your air cavity or your lungs uh, so that that air tank is there. And that's a really part important part of the support. Now I should say, um, as I get into this next bit, a lot of times I talk about air pressure and making sure that there's really high air pressure at the point of the read. I think that's technically, scientifically not exactly the right word. I think what I actually mean is that there's fast air and a lot of air speed at the read. Uh, but for me, I think pressure feels more right um, rather than speed because it is a sort of um, that's really, really fast air, and it's the speed that we're going for, and that's what matters, but it feels like a lot of pressure to me, maybe because it's a narrow passage that it's moving through, so it's maybe there's a little bit of back pressure or something like that. Um, so yeah, sometimes I use speed and pressure interchangeably. In this video, I'm going to try to use it more scientifically correct, uh, where I'm talking about speed at the point of the read is what we care about, and then pressure is just the air that we're holding in in our body. So the next big important part as we exhale to get air support rather than just exhaling, if you just exhale through the clarinet, even with a good relaxed breath and you just blow out and just let the air go out as if you're normally exhaling, it's not a very good sound. In fact, I got no sound that time because there wasn't enough speed uh, to get the reed to vibrate. Uh, so we have to do something to sort of focus in the air and, and get the air moving to actually vibrate the reed. So where, where this comes in is the Bernoulli principle. Uh, I'll leave a link in the description to a whole article that the uh, ICA uh, did somebody submitted it to the IC and it, and it won their research competition back in 2016 uh, and it's about like science of the art of legato uh, so it's it goes really in depth to this Bernoulli principle idea it has some really interesting embouchure suggestions and how to play which is very different from how I play um, so I'm researching that a bit more and experimenting with that uh, feel free to experiment with how that article describes to set up the embouchure I imagine it might be quite a bit different from how you normally set up the embouchure. Uh, but for me, it's kind of working. Um, I'm not sure if it's better than my normal embouchure yet, so I'll get back to you with that. But the information about the air and this Bernoulli's principle is interesting and worthwhile. So the very simple way that the Bernoulli principle works is that the speed of the air is determined by a couple variables. So when we're playing the clarinet, the air speed that we care about is at the point of the reed because that's where the reed needs to vibrate, that's where the air needs to be fast so the reed will vibrate. So that's sort of the point that we're talking about. And the variables involved in the speed of the air at that point are mainly two things. One is the volume of air in your tank and also the volume of air around you. We can't change the atmospheric pressure so that doesn't matter. Uh, but the air in our, our lungs and our air cavity, that tank of air, that's one of the variables. The bigger that is, the faster the air will move at the point of the read. And then the other really important variable is actually the size at the point of the read. So the smaller the opening at the point of the read, the faster the air will move. I think this is fairly intuitive that if you have a big tank going through a small opening, the air or water or whatever is moving through it is gonna move fast through the small opening um, because you have so much pressure of the large capacity on one side going into that small opening so it moves quickly. It can't move a lot through um, because it's a small opening so it has to move quickly to sort of balance that pressure. So what we need to do to have air support is hold open our air cavity as much as we can and then get as small of opening as possible at the point of the reed. And this is where the sort of like engage the cage, support from the belly, uh, push the stomach out, push the back out. Those are all kinds of things that different teachers say to talk about air support. And the reason for that is because all of those things 
hold open your air cavity and make that tank of air bigger so that the air at the point of the reed can be faster. So the way that it literally works is you have your diaphragm. Your diaphragm um, is hard to control. We can't really consciously control it, but our abdominal muscles are attached to the diaphragm. Uh, so when we engage the abs and engage the core, what's actually happening, and especially these back muscles too, um, sort of around the kidney area, it feels like to me. Um, if we engage all of those muscles around our core and sort of think about pushing them out or just engaging them, that holds the diaphragm down and that creates a bigger air cavity. Same thing with thinking about it with the rib cage. If you sort of push out the rib cage, that's a little bit harder too. That's a little less consciously controlled muscles to me, but if you, you keep those expanded and sort of push everything out, then that also helps to open this up. Now the important thing with this is that we want a big air cavity all the way to the point of the reed and then right at the point of the reed where it's where we have that high tongue position, tongue close to the reed to have that narrow point for, for the vibration. But it's really important that you're not tensing up your shoulders or tensing up your throat because that will create a narrow point there. And if you have a good big tank and you're engaging all of these muscles, but then you're tightening up your throat, um, then you're going to be getting high air pressure in your throat and then a narrow air cavity up here past that. So you're not going to have good air support. So lungs open abs, core engaged, rib cage engaged to hold that as big of a tank of air as you can get. And then completely relaxed open throat to again have that as open as possible. Even the soft palate, we want to be as raised and high as possible. That's where like engaging the top lip and also wide double lip embouchure is so beneficial because it raises that uh, soft palate. So that's really high and you have as open and big of an air tank as you can as it hits the back of your tongue and that starts focusing the air and then the tip of your tongue being close to the reed creates that very narrow opening so that you can have that really fast air rather than just a normal exhale of air. Uh, and that velocity of the air is what gets the reed vibrating, keeps the reed vibrating, and allows you to move smoothly from note to note. So that's the very uh, simple <laughs> elementary understanding of the anatomy of air support, but hopefully that gives you a better idea of what to think about. Uh, a couple important takeaways from this and maybe some things to work on as you're trying to develop your air support is it's not about pushing the air. If you try to blow out as hard as you can, <sighs> that's great but it doesn't work well for the instrument because it's just a ton of air pushing at the reed um, and the reed can't respond to that and vibrate. It's, it's too wide of an air stream. It's too forceful of air and will most likely cause your reed to just sort of collapse or you'll get a really gross distorted sound because it's too strong of air. What we want is a pretty relaxed way of playing. Yeah, maybe the core is significantly engaged, but really it's just about a natural exhale uh, with the tongue being nice and close to the reed so that you can have that really clear focus to the airstream and get that high speed. So for practicing this, the best thing to do is just long tones. And I think it is possible to get a little too in the weeds with thinking about like core, back, diaphragm, I can't even feel that, I don't know what's happening, ribs, lungs, can't feel those, I don't know what's happening, throat, soft palate, back of the tongue, middle of the tongue, tip of the tongue, embouchure, is my reed even good? Um, all of those things can sometimes be a little overwhelming. So remember at the end of the day, it, it doesn't really matter where your tongue is or, or what your embouchure is doing. What you wanna go for is what makes it easiest to sound the way that you want and always be picky with yourself about how you sound and always listen as you're doing your long tones because that is what will guide you to do the right things. Um, I use this analogy all the time with my students but if you think about professional athletes say you're throwing a ball in whatever sport it is um, Yes, at times they may think about like the angle and the position of their arm and sort of the, the release point and those kinds of things. But when they're actually in the game, when they're actually performing, all of that's been trained into muscle memory and it's just a matter of aiming for the target and throwing at the target. Um, it's impossible to 
keep track of all of the variables all of the time. So it's really important that you just sort of find a way to make it natural. And long tones are the perfect way to do that. So just practice your long tones, think about the sounds that you want, listen really carefully um, to the sound that you're actually getting and work in such a way that you can get that sound consistently, confidently, comfortably without doing anything too crazy or exerting too much energy. And that's what will allow you to sound the way that you want. So I hope that this has been helpful and interesting to get the sort of science behind this stuff. Uh, I think it can be very helpful, but at the end of the day, just go for the sound that you want, practice your long tones, practice long tones. That's the secret to truly playing really well. Uh, so thank you so much for watching. Um, this has been really great. I think it's sort of that back to school time and the channel's starting to pick up some, some traction again, which is awesome. So really, truly thank you for watching. Uh, I hope that this is helpful. If you enjoy this kind of content, subscribe, hit the bell so you get the notifications, all of that good stuff. And I look forward to seeing you in another video.